Recently on my YouTube channel, uh, I had a posting from someone living in India. And I thought I'd just read you what the posting said. I'm 14 years old, I live in India, and I'm interested in carpentry. I've got a few ideas, but don't have a drill machine or chisel, as they're expensive. It would be an honour if you could teach me the way to make cuts and slits in the middle of wood without any power tools. Thank you for posting videos on carpentry, it really helps. And that's from Sanjeeva Chitlapalli. Sanjeeva Chitlapalli. <laughs> Sorry if I've got your name wrong there, Sanjeeva. Um, anyway, he, his posting made me think that uh, I've actually been intending to post something on um, mortise and tenon joints for some time. And uh, he's really prompted me to, uh, to do something on that. Now, um, you will need a chisel, uh, Sanjeeva. Uh, but I'm hoping to show you how to do it with uh, with minimal, uh, with basically just with hand tools, with no machinery or anything like that. So this one's just for you, Sanjeeva. These are the tools we need to cut the joint. Uh, I've got two saws here. Uh, one's sharpened cross cut, and one's sharpened rip. You don't actually have to have the rip saw. Uh, you could do it all with a cross cut saw. Uh, it's just that the rip saw is slightly easier with cutting the tenons. But as I say, it's not essential. Um, <coughs> And then we've got the chisels, it should be a, a mallet with the little ones, a mallet. Um, so there's a mortise chisel there. <laughs> Again, uh, that isn't essential either. We could use an ordinary bevel edge chisel, uh, but the mortise chisel does give you a slightly cleaner mortise. Uh, it also allows you to give it, give it a lot more welling with the mallet. Uh, if your tenon doesn't fit for the first time, then there's a pairing chisel there or a bevel edge chisel for cleaning up the tenons to get it to fit. Various marking tools, um, a mortise gauge, engineer square or any other sort of square, uh, a ruler and a marking knife. I also have this little gadget which I quite like, it's a, a little uh, combination square which you can use for checking whether the ends of the mortise are square and also checking for depth. And of course the final thing is you have to have a cup of tea. So this is the sort of configuration we're going to be uh, uh, making the joint in. Um, it's a rather fake situation. I don't know of many situations where you just cut one single mortise and tenon joint. You'd usually do them in a, in a set of four, eight, sixteen, or whatever. Um, if you were sort of say making a door or a table or something like that, you'd have a whole set of joints, and the critical dimension would be the distance between the shoulders and that sort of thing. Um, so. This is, a, as I say, rather a fake situation. It's just an exercise in, in how to lay out and cut a single joint. Uh, so you can see, we've, um, I've marked up with a face side and face edge, so these are our square, our reference surfaces. Um, and our two face sides are gonna be orientated the same way, and we're actually joining into a face edge. Uh, that's a standard uh, way, of, way of doing a joint like this. So I'm going to do a little bit of adjusting so we can get in close to see how we do the marking out. I'm going to start by marking a pencil line across in the position where our mortise is, our tenon piece is going to be standing. So we're, we're, we're coming in like that. So I've marked that edge. I'm just going to mark the other side. So. So that's the actual position of the tenon piece coming in. We're actually going to have a shoulder, a 5mm shoulder on either side here. Um, so we wouldn't need to mark 5mm in from either end just to indicate where the mortise is going to start and end. So if I get my ruler out <coughs> and mark off 5mm and 5mm from the other side. that across and cut and do that with a knife. So that's the length of our mortise. Um, while we're using the square and the knife and things we might as well mark the length of the, uh, the tenon. Now there's no golden rule about um, how long a tenon should be, well it's not one that I know of anyway, because um, sometimes it might go all the way through, be wedged or something, or there might be a tenon coming in from the other direction which limits the size. But generally I like to have 
the, um, the tenon two thirds of the width of the frame piece it's going into, all things being equal. Now I'm going to have to do a bit of maths here. Um, oh, um, that's about 54 mil. Um, <clears throat> so 54 divided by 3 is 1, 18. So two thirds would be 36. So let's make our tenon 36 mil long. So I'm going to measure from the end 36, make a knife mark, and then put my knife into the mark that I made, slide the square up to it, and mark round, always keeping the stock on the datum surfaces. And if all things are equal, we should meet up at the beginning again, which we do. It's very gratifying. Um, so that's the length of our tenon, mortise marked out and the length of our tenon. All we're going to do now is put in the thickness of the tenon, the mortise. Now generally, one aims for the um, thickness of the joint to be a third of the piece that we're jointing. Now that only applies if, you, if, if you're making a frame with equal width members like this one where these are both the same width. Um, <clears throat> this is 26, 26, 27, 27 mil wide. Uh, so a third of that would be nine millimeters. Well, I don't happen to have a, have a nine millimeter chisel. The nearest chisel I've got available, which is uh, uh, which, which I'll be using, is this eight millimeter mortise chisel. Um, so what we're going to do, instead of actually making the mortise nine millimeters, we're going to make the mortise the width of the chisel. That's quite important because we make the mortise the width of the chisel, we'll also make the tenon the width of the chisel. And if we do our job right, the, the mortise should come out exactly the width of this chisel. Um, which means that we get precision, whereas if we make it 9 we're going to have to pair the mortise and it all gets a bit doubtful. So, I'm going to set the... It's almost set already, I think. I'm going to set the pins... If you, I don't know if you can see that. I'm setting the points of the pins to the corners of the chisel. Uh, so that's about right. What I've got to do now is to find the middle of this piece. Now it's not absolutely critical that I do actually have it in the middle because um, if I, as long as I mark from the same face then uh, the joint should uh, be in line. Uh, but it's quite nice to have it in the middle. So what I'm going to do is to find the middle I'm going to literally take a stab at it. So I've made a mark from one side I'm going to turn it round and see where those marks line up. And you can probably see that at the moment they don't. There they are. There. And they're not sort of in line yet. So I'm going to fiddle around until I can get them lined up. Now, I don't know whether the sanjeev has got a mortise gauge or not. You could just do this with an ordinary marking gauge. Um, it's probably a little bit more complicated, but you know, I'm sure you can improvise on that. So, I can now mark the thickness of the mortise. One little trick is that there is a danger of overshooting uh, when you're doing using a marking gauge but what you can do is put a little dimple in. So I don't know if you can see there, I've, I've created two little dimples just on the line there. Um, and what that does is that when you mortise, when you gauge along, the, mortise, the gauge drops into those dimples and stops rather than overshooting. And I can do the same here. I'm going to more mark the thickness of the tenon all around the end here. So I'll put my dimples there first. All right, so it's stopped in the right place. Um, <clears throat> so that's me marking up done now. Um, I could actually just sort of mark the waist if I wanted to, just to remind me where I'm going to be chopping, but it's fairly straightforward, so probably don't need to. 
Oh, one thing I've forgotten. I haven't done the uh, shoulders down this side, have I? Because uh, we're going to have five mil shoulders at either, either end, aren't we? So I'm just going to set up this gauge, the single point gauge, to five millimetres. And I'm just going to gauge around there. Now, theoretically, I ought to be marking it all from this datum surface, but I'm going to cheat and just come in five millimetres from the end. Otherwise, I'd have to reset the gauge and everything. Right, so I'm, I am now ready to, to start cutting this joint, having uh, done that last little bit. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so I'm going to reposition the camera so we can see a bit more in more detail what's going on. I've put the um, the mortise piece on the bench and I've clamped it on, so I've got the mortise over a, a bench leg, which is quite good because it means it's nice and firm and stable for, for chopping down with a mortise chisel. I've also checked with a square that it's actually sitting vertically from the bench because it's really critical that we're actually chopping and the mortise square on with this surface here which is also why I'm sitting here at this end of the, the piece so I can actually eye up to see whether my chisel is angled or not if it's leaning over then obviously the mortise will be uh, leaning over and then when we come to put the tenon in the tenon piece will be skewed uh, so it's quite important that we get ourselves organised in the right way. Um, so I'm going to start um, chopping this uh, mortise. And I'm going to get myself a bigger mallet actually. <coughs> okay, now it can be useful to leave that square that we use for checking, leave it there so you can actually use it as a, an aid to get that chisel vertical. So, start off about four mil in from the edge of the, from the end of the mortise, and we work our way forwards in about three or four mil wide chops, keeping the chisel right in between the two gauge lines. working my way back and you'll notice that the, uh, the bevel of the chisel is actually facing the direction I'm travelling in, in, you know, moving my chisel in. That's not just happenstance, that's intentional because you can see what's happening, the bevel is actually pushing the waste away from the cut edge, uh, which makes it easier to, to remove the waste later on. I'm going to actually stop soon, about the same distance from the other end this since I started at about four mil and I'm angling in the surprise. Right now we want to lever out the waste. So you want to try to make sure that you lever in line with the joint. If you lever leaning out over or not in line, you can end up damaging the, the edge of the joint. Now this is quite soft wood, this. this is a, it's not actually soft wood, it's a hardwood, but this is a, it's quite a soft hardwood. This is tulip wood or poplar, oh, which is quite good for practicing on. Um, you notice I've got the chisel the other way around now. I've got the flat face facing towards the clamp there. That's because um, when we're leaving the waste out, it the back end, the bevel here, acts as a fulcrum and also if we had the bevel that way around it would just sort of slide off the end, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be levered out very easily. So you can see I've got most of the waste out now. You can see that, so I'll just zoom in a little bit so you can see a bit better. You can see that's quite a clean 
a little bit sticking up there, a bit of furriness, but that's quite a clean mortise. And that's all been achieved just from going up and down, up and down with the chisel. I've not paired any bits from the edges there. That's a definite no-no. We're not going to be doing any pairing down the edges. That's that will introduce inaccuracy. So I'm just going to go down another chop and then we'll see, see if I measure it. See how, you know, we're probably getting a little bit close then. I've actually forgot now how deep we were going. 38 mil, I think so. Just turn it around just a straight line. Now obviously if you were using a bevel edge chisel you wouldn't be able to do quite as aggressive levering out of waste as I am with this uh, mortise chisel, I see there's, there's danger of snapping it. Um, but with a mortise chisel, it's one of another of the advantage of them, they're, they're pretty rugged. Um, right, so I think it was 38 mil that we were, um, the tenon was going to be. <clears throat> um, no, sorry, 36 mil which actually makes the, the mortise 38 mil deep because we could need to allow uh, a couple of mil at the bottom of the tenon for any glue that might get squeezed down because it's going to be a perfectly snug joint this one we're creating here and um, if it is then it's going to force the glue down to the bottom and if we don't allow a little reservoir for any surplus glue then we could end up with the hydrostatic pressure which stops the joint going together. Um, so we're looking for 38 mil we're actually on about 34 mil, so we're not so bad away. Um, I'll just set the set my combination gauge to. I'm just setting my combination gauge to 38 mil, um, and I can use that as a depth stop then, so I can go backwards and forwards, just checking with that, see where it's deep enough. So I've just got a little bit more to take out. Got to be a bit careful here. Um, Yeah, so that's telling me that's the right depth. So what we need to do now is to chop these ends here. Now it's more important that we're actually going vertical in that direction now, so I need to sort of change my position in order to chop them. Uh, so I'm sitting square on from the, uh, the joint. I've moved the camera around for this part because uh, I'm going to be chopping down now, I'm chopping down the end here. I've moved my, my position so I'm sitting at right angles to the workpiece and the camera had to move otherwise my arm would have been in the way. So <coughs> I'm now going to chop these bits at the end here. Uh, I've got down to depth um, so I can now take out the end. And the, reason, the reason why I've moved around this side is because now it's more critical that we're actually cutting down vertically here. Um, <clears throat> so I can either better sitting at this end than I can if I was sitting around the other end. And I'm working my way back to the line. I'm not chopping straight to the line straight away. I'm not putting the chisel there straight away because there's a danger if there's a lot of waste on the uh, tenon side, the mortise side of the, the, the chisel, it can push the chisel back beyond where I want it to be. So I'm actually creeping up on the line, which is a good principle to hold to uh, with most chiseling. And just drop it onto that knife. Same at this end. So now I think I've more or less squared it off. I can now try it out with this uh, combination square and I can check to see whether the ends are square or not. If now like that there, I can rock it backwards and forwards. It tells me that there's something stopping it going right to the end at the bottom. So I'm just going to take a little bit more off down there. And that's telling me whether the end of the mortise is vertical. So we don't want to have a wedge shaped mortise. Still not quite right. <clears throat> uh, 
that's better. Now it's butting right up to the edge there. So I'll just get rid of that little bit of waste. Okay. And as you can see, that's a fairly clean mortise. And that's just been achieved by going up and down, up and down with the uh, mortise chisel. Uh, there's a little bit of flappiness there, but nothing significant. Now quite often when people uh, come to cut them the tenon, they think, oh, I'm going to be careful here. I'm going to fight shy of the line and then I'll pair down to the line. And when they pair down to the line, they find the tenon, the tenon's too thin then. Uh, it's a lot better if you can um, cut to the line. And if you never try to cut to the line, you never will. Um, so, you know, you might go wrong a couple of times or a few times to start with, and then eventually you'll get the hang. And it'll be a lot more efficient. You won't be spending so much time pairing and fiddling and, you know, it all gets a bit uh, disheartening then. <clears throat> so if you can, try and get into the habit of sawing to the line. So what I've done is I've put the, multi, the tenon piece into the vise like this, so that um, if I saw down horizontally, I'll end up on these two corners where I'm sawing to. I'll just highlight the shoulder line that I'm cutting to. There we are. Um, <clears throat> now the reason I'm doing that is because I can see where the saw is going here. If I was to sort of put it in the vise, like that, I would be able to saw down here. I'd see what was happening here, but I wouldn't know what was going on at the back here. So that's why we do it that way. Um, and I've got it nice and low in the vise. If I put too high in the vise, then it vibrates and it all sounds a bit unpleasant and uh, it's not so accurate. So I'm guiding the, I'm going to start the cut on the top corner here. And I'm guiding the, I'm supporting the weight of the saw at the moment. So it's a very, very light start to the cut. I'm not pressing down, in fact, I'm sort of doing the opposite. I'm sort of lifting the saw. I've guided it in with my thumb, the tip of my thumb, and I'm sawing down. Now, I'm going to zoom in a little bit now just to see if you can see the cut there. Can you see the cut is along there and it's just rushing the, the line of the, uh, the gauge line that I've got there? I'll zoom back out again now. Yeah? Right, so if I continue the cut, and I'm using the same principle as when I, as I do in the uh, video on how to saw straight, I've got my arm dead in line with the line of the saw. So I'm sawing nice and straight. I'll now saw on the other side of the tenon. And now I'm going to turn it round and do the same on the other side. That's easy because you've got the curve to guide you in there. So I've got a cut going that way and a cut going that way but I've got this little lump in the middle which I've got to get rid of so I'm going to put it in vertically. Move the camera over a little bit, there we go. And saw down that little bit, trying to stop just on those gauge lines nice lines for the shoulders. Right. Now I've also got these shoulders to do as well, so I'm just going to come around and saw those bits there. I'll just have them vertically in the vice. I'm not going to bother with this tilting over a bit because it's quite a short distance. It's not so critical. Uh, 
And again on this side, see I'm guiding it in with, with different feelers. Right? I hit the line there, I might have a little bit of pairing to do there if I'm not careful. Right, so now I've got to saw the shoulder. The sawing here is much as it was for my how to saw straight video. Um, and if you remember in that we uh, knifed the line we're sawing to and then chamfered down to the line, which is what I'm doing here. I'll also chamfer down to the shoulders on either side there as well and then we'll be ready to do the, the, the saw cut to create the shoulders. I'm going to, if you've seen this uh, video on sawing straight you'll know what I'm doing here. I'm going to guide my saw in on that knife line and it's going to be helped in by the chamfer there and I'm bringing the saw progressively down onto the line and I'm continuing the cut. So be careful about the stance and that the arm is dead in line with the line of the cut. And then that should come away, not quite. There we go. Same on the other side. And then this bit here, you could do that in this in the vise, but I'm going to do it on the bench as soon as I'm here. Okay. I think all in all, I probably prefer to have done it on the vise actually. Um, now I've just got a little bit of cleaning up to do with this, uh, with a chisel, just to get rid of these um, bits along here. <coughs> what's going on on this side can you? That's the same as going on this side really and then there's just that little bit there to get rid of. Obviously sharp chisels pretty important at this bit. Um, this little bit here is quite important quite often you don't quite get that flat and it stops the thing going home. I'm just going to turn it round to the other side. That's looking fairly good. Now I wonder if it will go together or not. Just tidy up that edge there. Right, time of judgment. Right then, let's try the fit of this, uh, this joint. Um, I honestly haven't actually done any fiddling with it. So um, let's see how it goes. Oh, sometimes I surprise myself. Uh, that's not looking too bad. Um, there's a little, little bit of a gap there. But, um, it's not so bad there. But, um, which might indicate it's leaning over very slightly, but we'll do a little bit of um, diagnostics on this just to see if we can uh, or see how we do diagnose joints that don't go together. Uh, the first problem usually is it's too tight. Um, and you can tell, you don't know whether it's tight that way or, or that way. And one way of checking is to offer it up on the diagonal. Um, so if it goes together that way, then it must be, and it's still tight, it must be tight that way. And it tells you you've probably got to take a little bit off the, uh, off the inside of the mortise. If it goes in and then tightens up part of the way down, the chances are that it will be because 
the mortise is slightly wedge shaped that way and you've got to sort of check it out and, and pair off a little bit more down at the bottom there. Once it's gone together, oh the other option is <laughs> it's too loose, uh, which is probably more, more drastic really. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think a good test is to sort of turn it upside down and shake it like that and if it falls out then uh, it's, it's too loose and you've got to either start again or you could try gluing some veneer on but I always think that's a bit of a fudge you know um, or use very thick cask white which is a gap, gap filling glue but again it's a bit fudgy really um, the other thing you've got to check then once you've uh, once it's gone together is uh, is there any lean on the uh, is this leaning over in relationship to the uh, to the mortise piece and you can test that by putting a, a, a ruler against it and that's looking fairly good. Uh, there is a very, very slight bit of light showing through there, but I think it might be because my room is a bit bent even, I don't know. But that looks okay. Now, <clears throat> if there was, say there was some light showing here, uh, which would indicate that this is slightly tilted over this way, you'd want to try and correct that. You can sort of do some minimal correcting by pairing off a little bit off the bottom of the tenon here. That will then allow the, um, allow the piece to lean over a little bit, a bit that way. But it's fairly limited the, how much control you've got over that. Uh, you need to do that check first to see whether that's leaning over and correct it before you do any checking to see whether, the, uh, whether there's any gap around the shoulders. Um, you might find that uh, uh, you know the shoulder's nice and tight there, but there's a little gap here. You go and correct that. You sort of take a little bit off this side so that they're all sitting down nicely. Then you come to check this, and you find you've got to then tilt it over a little bit. You'll find you tilt it over, and then you've got a little gap at the shoulder there. So you always check to see whether the tenon piece is, is leaning over first before you check whether the uh, check and correct whether the shoulders are sitting correct down properly. Uh, and of course, one other check. I haven't should have done right at the beginning is, is it square that way but I was fairly confident that that would be because it was sitting down quite nicely on the shoulders. That's it really. Um, I just wanted to have a quick word about uh, the dangers of mortis and tenons, uh, specifically in relationship to uh, tenonitis. Tenonitis is characterised by bruising of the forehead and black eyes and things like that. And it comes about from people trying to pull joints apart like that and it suddenly comes apart and you go bang, bang into the forehead. Uh, I've had a number of students who have suffered from, I've suffered it for myself in the past as well. Um, and it comes of, of, of actually pulling the joint apart in the wrong way because if you've got a tight joint like that and you sort of go like that to sort of wobble it apart, then you loosen it and if you're trying the joint backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, which you shouldn't really need to do, uh, then you end up with a loose joint. The trick is, to turn the joint, really testing it, turn the joint this way up, and then you can pull it apart like that. And it's a lot better for the joint actually because you you're, you're pulling it apart at right angles to at least it should be you're pulling it apart at the right angles to the joint rather than wobbling it like that and creating a wear on the joint. Uh, so. That's it for mortars and tenors. I hope that's the, I've answered the question you asked, uh, Sanji, but I hope it was about this, not something else. If it was, then about something else, then let me know and I might try and answer your question specifically. If anybody's got any other sort of areas they want to, to, uh, want to have a look at, then uh, just let me know. Do a, a comment on my uh, channel and I'll see about doing something on it.